Hello and welcome to A Conquest, the last argument of King's faction ranking video. We've recently gotten our hands on some recent Q1 2024 faction ranking data, and I thought it would be interesting to present that and talk about it a little bit. So in this video, what we'll be doing is we'll be breaking down factions by ranking. We'll be talking about some outliers, why I think each faction might be ranking where they are, and some general commentary on each faction in the process of that. And then at the end, we'll be talking about the data that went into this and how to assess and interpret it. So on screen here, we have the Q1 2024 faction rankings, faction on the left, and then average placing on the right. Again, as a reminder, I will talk about what average placing means on the next slide of this video. Now, general observations around this data, something that is very interesting is that we're really, really tightly packed, basically across the entire middle of the spectrum. So the highest placing in these rankings is an average score of 3.7, which is city-states. And then it's not until you get all the way down to spires and then nords that there is any significant drop-off. And I will talk about that nords ranking at the end. So it was a bit of a surprise to me that city-states came in ranked highest here with an average of 3.7. But if we think about city-states and the journey they have been on, perhaps I shouldn't be too surprised. City-states, when they released, they landed, they won Adepticon with a splash, played by the very, very competent Ben from, I believe, Idaho in America. But they were then almost immediately nerfed by Parabellum, cutting back basically what at the time were the very optimal, like clear way to build the factions. The attachment on Hoplites lost Flurry, gained Relentless Blows instead. But it's taken time basically for city-states to recover from that. And there have been small buffs over time. Basically since those original nerfs, the faction has received basically nothing but buffs. And so we've seen kind of interest in them rebuilding over time. Now, when you see a placement like this, usually what it tends to communicate is there are probably a relatively lower number of inputs into the data or there are obviously there are a small number of very enthusiastic players that are playing this faction. So when we see City States at a 3.7, what that probably communicates to me is it's that passionate core that is contributing to that and pushing their placement in these rankings up. I think City States are a very interesting and very compelling faction. And especially as we look forward into like Q2 2024, when we expect to see the release of Chariots, I, if anything, I expect this score to increase. Chariots will open up a radically different playstyle for city-states. It'll allow them to do things with activations and range, like very competent range that they otherwise wouldn't previously have been able to. So yeah, things are surprisingly and unexpectedly bright for city-states in these scores. Now, next up, and kind of in a similar vein, we have Sorcerer Kings. Obviously, Sorcerer, King, Sorcerer Kings are the newest faction in Conquest by a wide margin. And so kind of, again, big grain of salt here with Sorcerer Kings. Now, if we look at the placements, right, 3.9, then it's 100 Kingdoms 3.9, then Old Dominion 3.9, then Dwegom 4, this is where we enter the very tight band of basically what is the median of these rankings. There is only a tiny bit that differentiates the next four or five factions, which is a really promising sign. Sorcerer Kings have snuck into the second place here, but ultimately it's worth considering that they are very, very new, and opinions on them and play styles with them are really going to be very unformed at this point. They have a very promising year ahead of them. There are a lot of releases coming. We've seen Elementals, the Starter Pack, the Mahout, which is very important. The Mahout's going to be one of the most important releases for Sorcerer Kings. Even though in this case they are ranked two, sort of in heavy use of air quotes, I'd encourage a fair bit of conservatism around that. Wait to see how they shake out, because this is really just reflective of the community's very initial impressions. And there's just a lot more to discover, the, discover with them before we have a really clear idea around where they sit. Now, less surprising is 100 Kingdoms in place three. Again, as a reminder, very tight bands here, right? It's not until we get to the bottom of the pack that we start seeing deviations from the norm, but 100 Kingdoms at 3.9, a very healthy ranking. I actually think this in large part kind of, you can set aside recent Adepticon results in terms of the influence on these placements. Adepticon was a little bit of an outlier in that we saw actually a relatively robust 100 Kingdoms presence. And I think 88 stands of Ash and Dawn across the, the 100 Kingdoms player base at Adepticon. That obviously was certainly a statement to borrow a phrase. But if we think about where 100 Kingdoms sit as a faction, 
uh, I think it's worth sort of exploring that they are a faction that has kind of a surprisingly wide variety of potential styles, and the community is beginning to actually fully understand all of the things that you can do with Hundred Kingdoms. Hundred Kingdoms have gone on this journey where at any given day, the like de rigueur Hundred Kingdoms list has been some kind of a borderline meme, whether it's infinite numbers of minimum small unit mercenary crossbowmen or massive cavalry bricks. But the basic core of Hundred Kingdoms being either veteran or relentless drills, like solid infantry blocks, backed up by all of these other like complementary elements. There's a growing realization in the community that Hundred Kingdoms can be played a variety of ways, including synthesizing different elements of their playstyle. So a personal and like really highly compelling way of playing Hundred Kingdoms for me is to have maybe two of the big high quality infantry blocks, and you can easily go up to three. Like a pure hedgehog list would use three high quality Hundred Kingdoms infantry blocks, but I have liked lists where I've run two of them, and that's spared up enough points to include a Priory Commander Warband, which gets you things like maybe a small unit of Ashen Dawn, but then also stuff like the Sealed Temple. And the Sealed Temple add into that mix just a tremendous versatility and mobility, like super high quality medium cavalry. And that list can even afford a Warlord Water Mage, which is very interesting and powerful. It's like the best healing in the game. So seeing 100 Kingdoms sit here, again, I know this is just a 3.9. Many factions are in that kind of band. But I think 100 Kingdoms thoroughly deserve that 3. And more importantly, I think... Th uh, place them in the 3. More importantly, I think they will continue to deserve it, even if the 100 Kingdoms Ashen Dawn Cavalry are nerfed following Adepticon. Next up, we have Old Dominion. Again, it is the third faction that has scored a 3.9, and this is not tremendously surprising. Old Dominion have always been just a super cool faction, a super unique aesthetic. They are very appealing to players. And they recently had a massive shot in the arm in terms of buffs to the faction. I, in fact, I think there's a fairly strong argument that Old Dominion were probably overbuffed. I very like not intentionally by Parabellum, but it's the kind of accidental overbuff that you get when a number of dials are all kind of turned at the same time. And I think in Old Dominion's case, the fact that early scoring was made less accessible, not inaccessible, but less accessible for every other faction, Old Dominion never had that anyway. They gained early scoring in the form of the Strange to the Strategos. They had a whole suite of other buffs, including changes to Legionnaires, etc. Legionnaires being just genuinely good and useful at the points cost now. Small nerf to Varangian Guard, that's totally tolerable and was very reasonable. But then on top of that, the faction just received a blanket plus one to their reserve rolls, meaning that to arrive with lights, you need to roll a five or less rather than a four or less, etc. And that was just a ridiculous buff to the consistency of the faction particularly given that of all factions, Old Dominion benefit really heavily from accelerating the pace of play. So if Old Dominion are all on the field early, even if your opponent, right, if you're playing Old Dominion and your opponent gets onto the field early, as long as you are there matching them, that is ideal for you because you want both armies to a trip down and sustain casualties. You're happy to trade because that trading makes you stronger and accelerates your late game. And the weakness of Old Dominion always was that their late game might arrive too late to shift scenario scoring in their favor. Like you often as Old Dominion relied on tabling your opponent and desperately hoping that scoring for the last two or three turns would get you over the line, that's going to happen like one or two turns earlier than it used to because of all of these changes to Old Dominion, and you might even have a scenario lead at that point anyway thanks to the Strategos. So ultimately, super compelling faction. We are just beginning to see like what those changes do, in addition just to the fact that Old Dominion are like super cool and appealing to players. I frankly would expect some nerfs coming to Old Dominion in the next update, but maybe small ones, although there have been some words from the developers around potentially new rules entirely that might limit or restrict Old Dominion as a faction. Next up, and at a clean middle of the pack, we have Dwegom at four which puts them fifth in our overall list of eight. Uh, Dwegom are a wonderful faction, but really have kind of just pottered on unchanged with slow nerfs to the Tempered Creed over time. But if we think about additions to Dwegom that might have changed where they have stood, I think the Ironclad Drake deserves special mention here. The, the Ironclad Drake, in addition to having an absolute baller of a profile, is just a tremendously awesome model. And locally, we are seeing Dwegom lists that are using three or even four Ironclad and Hillbringer Drakes in a list. And in addition to being 
truly terrifying, that's just super, super cool and compelling, particularly for the players that are running them. Uh, we have one player who has recently arrived, is playing Dwagon that way, is getting good results, and has had a number of things to say about how he's come from 40k, where in his opinion, if he wants to play big, cool, stompy things, there's like exactly one on meta way to do it, and if you try it any other way, you will get annihilated. So Dwegom really appealed to him, these big monsters, like he dropped by, he saw these, he saw these like huge drakes, he was like, I want some of that in my life. And the fact that the, that as a playstyle with Dwegom is not just playable, but it's in fact like really scary once you learn how to use it, uh, I think has contributed to Dwegom just sort of sitting very comfortably here with an average placement of four. Otherwise, Dwegom are still stuck in a little bit of a niche where the really the tempered creed is the most appealing part of Dwegom, and the less appealing parts of Dwegom. The, the Ardent Creed, I have a personal soft spot for. I think it's pretty cool. I have tried to play Ardent Creed in the past, but particularly when you look at things like the new Steel Shaper regiments that are coming out, so the Magma Forged and the Stone Forged, those are going to demand a lot of attention, which really just means, yep, okay, look, we're on a Tempered Creed bandwagon for at least the next six months. That is what it is. At some point, I expect Parabellum to turn back around and maybe give some attention to the other creeds, or give the Hold Reg a creed for the love of God. But right now, those absences really just aren't impacting Dragom at all, because there's just no need to engage with stuff that isn't compelling. Next up, we have Wadroon at 6 with a 4.4. Now, this is obviously going to be a significant drop from previous kind of placements or factional rankings, and that is basically because Dwegom, so Wadroon rather, remain a very like cool and interesting faction, but they got absolutely fucking hammered in the last update by what I have described elsewhere as a highly disruptive nerf. So what is a disruptive nerf? A disruptive nerf is when you have, like, maybe not huge individual changes, but changes that are designed, implemented by the developers, that are designed to break up existing playstyles. In short, make your existing mono-build army lists not work anymore, so you have to find new ways to play the faction. Now, for everyone else's sake, that tends to be relatively healthy, because when a faction has been optimized to the point of having a mono build, it becomes very boring to play against, even if it is compelling to play with. And Wardroon were kind of in that position, where you had, like, the Tontor with the Mantle, and then you would build around that. Yes, I know that in America it was considered better to play the Tontor, to so play the Mantle on Thunder Riders. That's just a sort of, like, a national approach, and in any case, when we get the data sources below, we'll sort of see how that plays out. But Regardless, a disruptive nerf is always almost almost always going to knock the faction down because it's going to take time for players to re-engage with the faction, to think about what works now. It's really, it's very disruptive to player enjoyment almost to a sense, to basically be told, hey, look, you built this list, you painted this list, it does not work nearly as well as it used to, you're going to have to figure out a new way. That takes often not just mental investment, but sometimes financial and time investment as well. And that's a bit rough for Wardroon. And I think that's the reason why we see them actually making a significant jump down here from 4 to 4. Dwegom at 4, Wardroon at 4.4. Now, I would say the future looks relatively bright for Wardroon. The developers have basically said, yeah, yes, we know we did this to the faction, we had to break up the, the you know, the mantle mono meta, but Wardroon generally are in need of a little bit of a potential rework. To kind of like, you know, chanting could really use a polish, maybe a change to how it functions. I think chanting generally is a mechanic that the developers really liked and thought was really cool, and very reasonably so, but balancing a faction and designing a faction around the chant mechanic is going to place constraints on the developers. And Woodrun are kind of showing that at this point. So I would say Woodrun are a faction that right now, you know, they've dropped down to sixth position in our rankings here, but we can probably expect to see them jump up pretty significantly at some point in the future. Next up, in seventh place, we have Spires with a 5.1. Now, this is probably going to be reflective of the fact that Spires are always a polarizing faction. Spires are a faction where even just like aesthetically, right, setting aside how they actually play, they are a faction that will really, really grab some people and just not attract anyone else. And you can see that kind of here at 5.1. But that is actually, I mean, I've spoken in other videos, particularly when talking about other games like Infinity, that's a good place for things to, like, things should exist that are like that in games, because you don't want to build a faction that appeals kind of a little bit to a lot of people. You want to build factions and armies that appeal a great deal to a smaller number of people, so that everyone can find something that they really, really like, rather than everyone just finding stuff that's kind of okay. Now, 5.1 here in Four Spires is surprisingly low, but 
spires have always been a faction where you have an absolute like ton of engagement with the faction and performance from the faction out of a small number of people and then for everyone else it's kind of like you know, they, they oh, okay they're spires they're interesting okay whatever oh let's that's that's someone else's army and I'll, I'll come back to them at a later date now on top of that spires have also had a recent disruptive nerf similar to woodrun um and so a lot of spires lists have stopped working the way that they used to i know personally uh, i was quite down on spires for a period during q1 2024 because basically immediately following CanCon, the list that I played at CanCon got fucking nerfed hard. Uh, not only were there points increases across the board, which made the army no longer legal, but uh, the medium characters in light units dynamic that I made heavy use of just doesn't exist anymore. Just, just not, That's not in the game anymore. Characters now inherit the weight class of their regiment, which I think overall is a good change. But it meant that basically for all of Q1 2024 after January, I just had to let Spires cook for a little bit and think about how to approach them. Now, from a purely personal note, I would say that I have since recovered from that. And I am feeling very optimistic about some Spires lists I've made that have adapted to the changes that have been imposed on them. But we are waiting to see the impact of those. I've had like literally one game with Spires, with the new lists, where I'm like, no, actually, this is cool and this works. And that's that's only very recent. So this is another faction I would expect to see normalize over time. Finally, in eighth position with a 7.3, we have Nords. And this is actually the only faction that I'm not surprised to see. Like This is more of an outlier than I expected, but only by a little bit. Now, yes, actually, I do believe Nords recently won Adepticon, and that is not hugely surprising in terms of thinking about how to lean into the power of the faction. But the big problem with Nords, the overwhelming challenge with Nords, is that the power fantasy of the faction is completely divorced from the actual mechanical power of the faction. And that leads to players, particularly like the broader player base, consistently misappraising them and then having a bad freaking time. How Nords look like they should play is like big, beefy brawler dudes that want to get into melee and then have a slugfest because they're they're Vikings, damn it. And they're going to get up close and personal and punch a whole lot and rah, rah, rah. But how Nords actually play is like freaking Wood Elves, where they are fast, very fast, but they are fragile. They are dangerous, but they are very fragile. And they have this kind of like surprisingly high power mid-range ranged game that's then backed up by monsters. But again, the monsters are just single dudes. They are robust, but they're not invulnerable. And so especially the fragility of Nords, right? Nords being a glass cannon, very, very fast, particularly because of Vanguard, because of the... Garmin supremacy, which is near ubiquitous, although the Yarl supremacy is beginning to emerge as a like, oh, actually, this is really good. Um, like, the Yarl supremacy is probably still kind of being slept on, and people are just beginning to wake up to it. But Nords being this, like, speedster, glass cannon, ultimately fragile army. Like, the first time you put Uger on the board, and you're like, oh, yeah, those dudes are Clash 3, Cleave 2. Holy hell, they're incredible. And then just, like, a crossbow shoots you, and half the regiment dies, and you're like, this is not fulfilling my fantasy of this faction. Uh, we have seen, this is anecdotal, but we have seen, I think, two or three players locally pick up Nords, get like super keen for the fantasy of the faction, get freaking annihilated because it doesn't play the way that they thought it would play from looking at it, and then set it down and grab something else. And kind of for that reason is why I think Nords kind of rightly sit in eighth position here at 7.3, despite recent like competitive results in the US at Adepticon, etc. I think if anything, Nords are the faction that needs redesign the most. Like we compare that to Wardrune, who, you know, probably could use a glow up in terms of making the making the faction more balanceable around the chant mechanic. Nords, I think the developers need to just look at it and say, everyone picks these up and assumes they'll play a certain way, and then they don't play that way, and then they complain. Maybe the problem actually is not the players in this case. If such a huge proportion of the possible player base for Nords wants the faction to play a certain way, maybe just let the faction play that way. Now, I have no idea how they would do this. Uh, I actually had a local make a very interesting suggestion, which was that if you change Blood of the Iron Hajar to be a bonus to your defenses while you are in melee, then you immediately have a faction that marries that like high speed with I want to get into melee with I'm vulnerable until I get there, but once I get there, I can brawl for a period of time. Now, balancing that would be a challenge because Nords have, like if you make Nords tough in addition to everything else once they get into a fight, you have a very scary, very scary faction on your hands. I'm sure there would be a way to do it. Maybe it would be like plus one defense against clash attacks so that 
impact attacks and spells and volley attacks continue to be an effective way of dealing with them. Like there's a bunch of ways that you could do it, but Nords, I think just so like of all factions, the fact that they mechanically are so divorced from their fantasy is a problem. And that is why we see them here. Now, with all of that said, let's just do a quick look at how the data for this video was gathered. Uh, so, yeah, all data for this video was taken from a random conversation with my locals about what we personally liked and thought was cool. Uh, this is not a competitive ranking at all, and I'm sorry if you got that impression. Happy April 1st, everyone. <laughs> A particular credit to Alex for inspiration for this video. Uh, you can see that comment there on the right where they presented this information to me that way and I lost my shit for a good three seconds before I realized what they were talking about and they were just recapping the popularity discussion we'd been having over the last week. Uh, Alex, you got me really good and I thought it only reasonable to turn this into a video that I might get some other people good as well. So look, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. A lot of the things I've been saying, please go back and reconsider them in the context of we are literally just talking about the popularity and interest and engagement with the factions. But I did mean a lot of the things that I said and I hope this was an interesting discussion. So yeah, happy April Fools, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this, at least to an extent, and I will be back with some more con Conquest content, hopefully at some point in the future.